to the uh, panel on Holocaust, Genocide, and Contemporary Bioethics. In this session, we intend to discuss strategies discussed or used by the Nazi party to justify criminal medical research and genocide through its public health propaganda. We all say never again, uh, but today we want to really discuss how we can ensure that it won't. One of the difficulties of having a conversation like this is that whenever we talk about the Holocaust or genocide or, or these types of uh, traumatic uh, and incredibly uh, uh, gravitous types of uh, uh, events in history, uh, the conversation usually disallows us to get past the horror of what occurred in order to examine the systemic, uh, the institutional, let alone the social and the individual mechanisms that allow an efficient and medicalized atrocity like the Holocaust. But on the other hand, to give a picture of what happened from a 30,000 foot vantage point uh, in order to recognize when similar tactics or rhetoric is used in the present and the future would, would also be disadvantageous since much of what motivates us to say never again and to act on that wish is the emotional and personal effect that the Holocaust has on all of us as human beings, as survivors, and as relatives of survivors. Given the difficulty of broaching this type of subject, we've decided as a panel to try something just a, a little bit different. Instead of immediately getting personal and telling stories, our stories, uh, from our own history, and rather than looking from a big lens to see what this type of discussion in political theory or historiography might look like, we want to enter this public conversation on the Holocaust, genocide, and contemporary bioethics by first introducing background into different aspects of how the Nazis used public health and medical technology to, pu to push its agenda, how different professionals were recruited and participated in state-sponsored horror, and how we as a people have learned from the Holocaust so far in changing the ways we approach research, how we approach healthcare, as well as how we can do more to learn from history to ensure a peaceful future. Today, besides myself, we have four amazing panelists uh, who, who we, we've all spent considerable time thinking about how people, how professionals, how organizations, and how institutions adapted to and were swept up in the wave of genocide that was the Holocaust. After I introduce the speakers, I will start by giving certain background and question prompts that provide just enough information to get the conversation going among the panelists. And the panelists will both fill in that information and then take that prompt to give further background and suggestions for what we can learn and what we can implement today. This is not going to be a question and answer format. Um, rather, you should see this as a way that I'm engaging the panelists and prompting them to consider both amongst themselves and with you, how to talk about such an important and emotionally laden topic such as the Holocaust and its lessons for preventing genocide and bolstering contemporary bioethics. So with that, let me give you a little bit of bio onto, onto our panelists. Uh, the first we have uh, is uh, Stacy Gallup, who's the, <laughs> not, not uh, <laughs> who is the founder and director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. She earned her doctoral degree in medical humanities from Drew University and taught courses on bioethics and the Holocaust and human subject research ethics. Dr. Gallen founded the Maimonides Institute in 2015 as a way to transcend the generational, religious, geographical, and professional boundaries of Holocaust education and protect the legacy of those whose lives were changed irrevocably by the horrendous events that took place in the Holocaust. Next, we have uh, Dr. Susan Miller. Uh, who is the John Dunn Senior Research Chair in General Internal Medicine at Houston Methodist and is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and a professor of Clinical Medicine at the Institute of Academic Medicine at Houston Methodist Research Institute. She is also an Associate Professor at Weill Medical College, Cornell University, and the Deputy Chief in the Department of Family Medicine at the Methodist Hospital, as well as an Associate Professor in the Center for Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Miller is also currently the Senior Chair of the Institutional Review Board of Methodist Hospital Research Institute and is the Director of the Chow Program for International Research Ethics. Wow. That was a bit of a mouthful, <laughs> so I'm going to see the water on that. Sitting next to her, too. <laughs> it's not contagious. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Um, on the bar we have uh, William Silvers, he's a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and an allergist in private practice for 35 years, 20 uh, in Aspen. Bill's parents are survivors who married in Rodham Poland's ghetto in 1942, were forced into labor camps, and then deported to Auschwitz and separated in 1944. They survived, and are the reason Bill has dedicated himself to remembering and transmitting the lessons of the Holocaust and genocide. Matthew Rinia is the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado. Uh, and just Matthew. Dr. Winnie's career has included developing a research institute and training programs focusing on bioethics, professionalism, and policy issues at the AMA Institute for Ethics, and founding the AMA Center for Patient Safety. His research has focused on novel uses of survey data to inform and improve the practical management of ethical issues in healthcare and public policy. He has led projects in a wide variety of topics related to ethics and professionalism, including understanding and measuring the ethical climate of healthcare organizations and systems, ethics and quality improvement, communication, team-based care, and engaging patients as members of the team, defining physician professionalism, public health and disaster ethics, medicine and the Holocaust with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and inequities in healthcare uh, and health. He has served on committees, expert panels, and is a reviewer for the Institute of Medicine, the Joint Commission, the Hastings Center, the American Board of Medical Specialties, federal agencies, and other organizations. Dr. Winnie is a past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanity, and has chaired the Ethics Forum of the American Public Health Association, and the Ethics Committee of the Society for General and Medicine. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, of course, there's, there's me. I'm, I'm Ira Benzo. I'm a senior scholar at the Aspen Center for Social Values, and director of Biomedical Ethics and Humanities at the American Public Health All right. Let's get, let's get these questions going. Uh, first, so I'm going to give the question prompts, but I'll, I'll give a general category of where these questions fit in just to give you a bit more context. So the first question is going to relate to the medical profession's role in the Holocaust. So German physicians joined the Nazi party in greater numbers than members of any other profession. When joining the Nazi party, physicians adopted a professional goal of promoting the health of the nation rather than healing individuals. Two big picture factors that made this possible was the erosion of the doctor-patient relationship in the years before Hitler came to power, and the commercialization of medical practice. Through Germany's medical insurance program, insurance companies regulated the workload of physicians, controlled which physicians patients could see, and pushed for rationing resources, all of which was justified as a means to maintain the healthcare system given the financial constraints and economic instability of post-World War I Germany. When seen from this big picture perspective, one might be able to draw parallels to today's healthcare environment in the US, where the business of healthcare has been affecting patient physician relationships. What institutional mechanisms exist to avoid a similar erosion of the medical profession's focus on individuals' well-being for the sake of the population's health? Susan, would you like to take that one Okay, so my answer is a partial answer because I actually think we only have partial protections. Uh, we do not have something that will prevent a complete erosion of the physician-patient relationship. So what are the things that serve as a partial protection is that we currently have a diversity of healthcare options, some of which is private, some of which is through insurance companies, some of which is federal funding. So that's a partial protection, even though we have a lot of systemic conflict over the Affordable Care Act. But something that exists now that I think did not exist in the 1920s and 1930s and 40s was an emphasis on individual autonomy, okay? So that the, the patient themselves had a voice and a role in what sort of health care decisions were made. And also today, we have social networks which are based on that individual autonomy. So when you look at um, the breast cancer and networks that people have, or what are websites or blog sites and all that, there's sources of information that are based on that. And just as an example, when they were having some discussions about mammogram indications, that there was a whole social network that had um, impact on what the legislature's mandated was paid for. 
I would hope that now that there's more physician resistance to that, and I think that is a partial protection, especially if physicians continue to serve as advocates for their patients, okay, as opposed to saying it's the government that I'm putting the emphasis on. And if physicians are trained as being moral agents in this regard, that they can have a way to protect their patient relationships. What still exists now is a legal infrastructure that protects the fiduciary responsibility of the physician-patient relationship. And I know we don't have enough time to go into that, but historically you can look at how the law was used to um, discriminate and not to protect vulnerable populations under the Third Reich. And we have this concept of HIPAA, we have this concept of patient um, confidentiality that I did not think exists at that time. And these are social influences that exist on our, um, on our medical system from the legal system. We still, I'm old enough, I'm an old lady, okay, that I still have patients that I've taken care of for 30 years, okay? So I have a continuity of relationships with patients that I think acts as some protection. But when you look at how people are signing up for health care and they just pick a name on the list because of gender or whatever, and it changes every year because that's what their insurance companies are paying for, that becomes a barrier to establishing long-term relationships. Now, I say that, but the risks still exist, and, I, and I, I, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't talk about what these risks are. We still have risks regarding reimbursement. Um, we have risks because the insurance companies have financial credentialing of physicians based on how much care we order, the lab tests that we're doing, and whether we're ordering expensive medicines versus generic, and that these insurance companies will actually de-credential physicians based on this. They have, out of this, they have a list of what prevert providers are, and so that is a barrier to protection. The fact that we have to do pre-authorization of procedures or medications, and that there is still continued discrimination against vulnerable population in our society where we are not protecting the vulnerable populations as a human rights issue. The electronic medical record is a way that we're losing confidentiality. Please believe this, the social networks where you have direct marketing, um, where the pharmacies will sell their, pharma, their patient lists so there can be direct marketing because that's a freedom of speech issue. The fact that we have mandatory reporting of certain illnesses, again, that's an erosion um, of, of the patient-physician relationship. And my final comment before Matt, I hope I haven't taken a hold of the answers, is that Insurance companies and the government and employers are defining what the patient's health care needs are because they're defining what they're going to pay for. And so, I mean, we can talk about Viagra, you know, that that can be paid for, but, that's some, but not paying for maternal care and not paying for contraception are ways that our society is defining what sort of health care access that people have. And that also extends to research, but that's beyond the scope of this question. Uh, Matt, I hope you're, you don't mention this also, but just one thing I just want to, uh, to further the question. Uh, when, you know, we, we talk about patient autonomy a lot, and I would say patient autonomy is, is now like first among equals in, in medical values, uh, we see that as a great protection. The difficulty with relying on patient autonomy is it demands a lot from the patient. It mm -hmm. demands the patient has knowledge and is also empowered to be able to act on that autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you don't mind, also going to answer your question, can you speak a little bit in terms of how patient autonomy in, in practical effects as opposed to just as a virtue um, can be used to bolster us against some of the uh, institutional or financial constraints that, that, that we see? Yeah, so um, this, this could go on for a long time, I think. Uh, this is sort of the crux of uh, the whole evening, I suppose. Um, one of so I agree. Uh, we've got a social uh, value set today, which is quite different, right? And that's true both in the U.S. and in Europe. If you think about Europe in the and the U.S. in the 19 teens and the 20s, the so-called progressive era of medicine, um, the notion of individualism just was not as strong mm -hmm. as it is today. Mm -hmm. Um, the libertarian impulse has really strengthened over the last 40 years, maybe mm -hmm. 50 years, in part as a response to what happened during the Holocaust. 
So, uh, so we have something that people of that era didn't have, which is this lesson of history of what happens um, when a professional group starts to see its primary responsibility as lying in um, population health and, uh, and you know, a pure gene pool, that kind, of, that kind of thinking, we recognize as being dangerous today, and we did not recognize it as dangerous. And when I say we, I don't mean German doctors, I mean American doctors, right? Many of the, um, many of the, of the initial proposals uh, and policy um, sort of, uh, this is the wrong word, but advances, of the Nazi doctors and the Nazi public health uh, environment came from the United States, right? They looked at our anti-miscegenation laws. They looked at our uh, forcible sterilization programs for people who were disabled. And they said, you guys are doing good stuff. You're just not taking it far enough. And there were plenty of people in the United States who looked at German uh, laws, uh, the Nuremberg laws, and said, finally, someone is taking these ideas to their natural conclusion, right? Instead of just uh, preventing people from getting married, we're going to sterilize them. And of course, the, you know, the next step is instead of keeping them alive, we're going to kill them off if we don't want them to be reproducing. Um, and this, you know, took, 15 years to evolve, but it was, um, it was not because Germans were having thoughts that were different from the thoughts that American uh, public health and medical professionals were having at the same time. They were just more aggressive. And there were plenty of American doctors um, who thought they were doing the right thing. So I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's the case that we have um, explicitly learned the lessons of the Holocaust. Unfortunately, I think uh, we have to have reminders on a fairly regular basis of the lessons of the Holocaust. And at the same time, I think the lessons of the Holocaust are embedded in almost everything we do, whether we know it or not. They're certainly embedded in the um, strength with which we defend individual liberty and uh, autonomy in healthcare. And so, um, so I, 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 th I think that's true. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is um, the way in which uh, these things played out in Germany really relied a great deal on the closure of professional debate, right? So in the US, eugenics was very widely um, promulgated and some policy implications of eugenics were implemented, things like the anti-miscegenation laws. But there were always people who questioned the scientific and moral legitimacy of eugenics. Though that minor, even if it was a minority voice, they were never shut down. There was ongoing debate and deliberation all the way through and, and until the point at which all of a sudden everyone said, wow, that was a terrible idea. Right? And now you can't find anyone who would support the ideals of eugenics. Um, but the fact is we had, and we have today, very rigorous uh, public, uh, often vitriolic debate. And I don't know about you, but this is a comfort that I take in the vitriolic debate that I see in our country. The fact that we have um, really uh, aggressive debate ongoing all the time, as uncivil as it may be, is far better than a society in which we don't have that. And that is a protective mechanism. The fact that we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people protesting in the streets, and we've got, you know, neo-Nazis being, you know, protesting and having anti, you know, that's a good thing for us. And I know it's hard to say that because I don't enjoy it, but I get some comfort in knowing that vigorous debate is a protective mechanism in a society. The time to get scared is when everyone's on the same page. I think it's entirely true. Um, Matt, I will tell you, I think that all the institutional uh, safeguards and mechanisms are our, our best efforts. 
and given the, uh, the, the history of the past, not wishing to repeat it. However, I think that the only safeguards that we have are the individual physician's commitment to primum non nocere, to the sanctity of life, and protecting the patient rather than becoming an instrument of the state, of the insurance companies, of the health care plans, uh, and the payer systems, et cetera. We need to be our, the patient's last uh, uh, protector, number one. And number two, it, the societal uh, objection to, uh, to, to, to what is wrong, as an example. I was just in, uh, uh, in Germany uh, this past May. We had the second international workshop on medicine after the Holocaust. Stacy and, uh, and Susan were there in Israel. But a number of us went to Germany and Poland prior to Israel. And I went to a, this German psychiatric hospital, Hadamar, which I learned that despite, as Mark Levine taught uh, us during our first Holocaust contemporary bioethics program in 2008 at the University of Colorado, um, the German medical society had the best, most stringent code of medical ethics in the world at that time, and they were entirely thrown out come 1933 in the Third Reich. Uh, because the physicians became instruments of the state in preserving public health, as you've addressed in this. Uh, so despite the best efforts that we have, it can be entirely disregarded, given what the politics may be. However, what happened in Hadamar is that they were taking to purify the Aryan race, etc. not just Jewish, but they were taking mentally <coughs> ill, the feeble-minded, the disfigured, those uh, elements of society that did not contribute to the German race, and they were killing them. They were basically, they developed the concepts of the gas chambers in the psychiatric hospitals, starting in 1933, definitely 1939, and they just, you know, exported that to Poland. But what I learned is that this became public, and then it was only because a German Catholic bishop spoke up against it that the German authorities decided to go quiet at that time. So society can have a role as a whole, but the individual physician really has to, you know, uh, play his part in terms of protecting the patient. So, uh, my thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, just one short thought. The, um, I think the answer to a lot of the questions that we're going to discuss here can really be summed up with one word, and that's education. That is our strongest tool. It is our greatest weapon. Um, the fact that you're all sitting here today listening to this gives me hope that we can continue to have these conversations. We can continue to discuss not only what took place and reflect upon the past, but use it to protect the future. To me, there's a system of checks and balances in place in society in general, if you look at the way our government is set up as a democracy. That system of checks and balances needs to continue throughout society, throughout medical care. Everyone on this, uh, everyone on this panel is a scholar. Um, the, my other three colleagues here are also medical doctors. I am not. Um, I consider myself to be an advocate. And as an advocate, I feel that it's my job to empower people and I believe that the best way to do that is with education. Um, if you know these stories, if you understand some of the things that we're discussing up here, if you understand what the mechanisms are and the ways that they can be used either uh, to stifle members of society or to raise them up, then um, right there, we're, we're ahead of, of the game um, and we're in a much better situation uh, than we were in Nazi Germany. Well, no, thank you. I, I, we're gonna touch a lot on the individual and role in education uh, and, and the profession, uh, professionalism in, in general. But I want to I want to touch a little bit. Everyone mentioned society here and how society is allows us to have a check since we've we've learned from history and uh, having these vitriolic debates are, are are beneficial. With regards to social acceptance, however, you know the the conflation of eugenics today we might call it genetic engineering and enhancement and radical German nationalism was rejected by the German elite and the nation as a whole, it, just until it was not. And then when it wasn't, it was, it was accepted very quickly, or at least complicitly overlooked very quickly. And the inflection point, which changed the views of many, 
was the political and economic instability after Germany's global falling from grace after its defeat in World War I. In the, in the years after World War I, social discourse on the nation's health changed from promoting healthy citizens to removing unhealthy members of society, which, which Bill, you mentioned, including both citizens and foreigners. So it's not a matter of, well, thank goodness for social debate, because the economic and political instability of that debate it can change that debate very, very quickly. And we know that nations will always experience rises to power and falls from grace in the eyes of the international community. So knowing that we have, thank God, that social debate today, what lessons have we learned or can we learn from Germany's history to avoid the uh, uh, shutting down of that social discourse or, the, or that social buffering that a national crisis might, might promote? Any, any of you could take that one. I'll take this one first. Um, I think the lesson is, is, is to pay attention, to pay attention to um, propaganda, to pay attention to what is, is, is being put out there. When nations find themselves, as Germany did after World War II, in a situation where they were once the greatest power, they no longer are, they suffered many losses um, during battle, and a charismatic leader comes along and says, I have a way to make this nation great again. Everybody listens, right? Um, and I think I'm not saying anything political other than to point out that in situations such as those, oftentimes we're looking for a scapegoat as a community. We're looking for people to place blame on and we're looking for a way to regain the status that we once had as a superpower. And I don't necessarily think that that changes whether we're talking about Germany in the 1930s or whether we're talking about, let's just say, other countries in other times. Um, I think it's very important, again, and I apologize, I'm gonna repeat myself a lot, to remain educated. Um, it doesn't matter really which side of kind of the spectrum you find yourself on. The education is out there, the beauty of our resources today is there's so much, there's so much out there. We need to find a way to figure out, first of all, what the accurate uh, representations are. And that's part of the reason why we do these programs. So I think a lot of people are aware of the Holocaust as a genocide, but not necessarily as an example of medically sanctioned genocide. So we need to keep talking about these things. Um, and we need to kind of understand that we do have power to fight back. Um, and we need to use that power. So, thank you, Stacy. Because I, I think vigilance is essential. We need to remain vigilant. And um, uh, uh, the theme that I have learned from exploring this topic is how vulnerable we are to dehumanizing people that we view as different. Okay, and when you dehumanize and say that someone is inferior, I don't care if it's based on a gender or which country you're from or what medical diagnosis you have or what religious affiliation you have, that for the people in power to be able to gain power, they have to dehumanize and label someone as an enemy. And what, what happens from that when we dehumanize people and we accept that as truth and we listen to that hyperbole, it allows normal people to do monstrous things. Okay, it's that dehumanization that to me is, is a crux for that. So what's an antidote for that is to be able to actually believe in the importance of social diversity. Okay, because when you have, if you have differences, these can become foundations to solutions for how a society can solve an issue. So when I look at complex issues in my healthcare delivery system, I have nurses, doctors, administrators, ethicists, pharmacists. It's a multi-dimensional approach to it and not just saying I'm gonna be physician-centric or ethnocentric or have a tunnel vision approach or that's the way we've always done it, is to say what is the truth of what's being said. And when we use words of humiliation, when we use words of shame, when we um, protect citadels that maintain um, ethnocentric approaches, we're at a risk of harm. 
I think that when we look at the people that did not participate in some of these activities um, in the Third Reich and even in other cultures, because genocide exists in multiple cultures, is that these are individuals, the outliers were people that believed in altruism. They took care of friends, family, but they took care of strangers. What we're living through in Houston right now with the, the flood, it's strangers are coming to help a part of the solution. So they're not looking at whether it's just my neighbor that I'm gonna help or my family, it's how the community is coming together to help the, the, the city heal. What do we have as risks that we're hearing is that they're trying to take away freedom of the press. We had radios, you know, in the 1930s. It, those were the, that was the way that people communicated or the propaganda newspapers. But they, if they wanted to hear a truth, they had to have these hidden radios. And so what do we have as ways of perhaps having access to truth is the internet. What are they doing in Russia? They want to get rid of Facebook or they want to control Facebook. The person who's in charge of the Russian equivalent of Facebook is someone who was appointed as a crony of Putin so that he can control the messages of what people are having as society. And so when we look at these blogs that are, that are uh, disrupting social um, relationships, it's like you've got to look at more than one source of information. So if we avoid censorship and if we avoid slogans which lead to violence, that can be an antidote for how society can approach it. And I think that, and Matt, I mean, one of the things that when we see what's going on with all of the civil discourse and uncivil discourse that's happening in society, what I'm worried about is that the, those are, will be a tender to race riots, okay, where you're seeing people really having the violence that they are accelerating instead of just having differences of opinion. And so that we have to have ways of protecting the sanctity of, of that discourse. Um, one of the things that Hitler did is that he believed in spontaneous violence, but that was, you know, it was not just something that just came up organically. It was something that was initiated in, in the culture. And I think my final point is avoiding unexplored obedience and loyalty, okay? Because that's what's being punished. We have a system that where truth is like reality TV now. So I think that all of us need to have a way to say what is truth, can I read the other side? Can I see what the other side is saying so that we can have a, a point of reference for discussion? The Matt, you'll wrap it up here on this question. Uh -huh. um, we well, you know there's a saying that all it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. And uh, I think that that speaks to the uh, uh, the responsibility that each of us, for example, each of us who are here are obviously sensitive to what's happening in our society today, to what happened in the past, and to not wishing to see some of the things repeated in the future. So it's, it falls upon us here to be the, the, the sentinel cells, you know, to, uh, uh, to be conscious. Um, and we have that recent precedent that we've, you know, witnessed via our parents, uh, you know, the previous generation that is now passing away. And I think that that's one of the compelling uh, motivations for not losing those lessons of history as the ones who directly experienced it or witnessed it or witnesses to it, uh, you know, will no longer be able to testify uh, to it. I think the other thing that I'm very impressed by, quite frankly, is that for example, on this panel, we have two, two Jews and two non-Jews. Matt Winia approached this from the non-Jewish perspective because he feels that this is not just a Jewish uh, uh, concern, but that this is part of our you know, um, medical profession uh, experience, that, we, that, the, that, the, that the profession of, of, uh, of physicians did not answer what would be a moral call. You'll, you, you phrase it even better. But that, this is, uh, but that this is something that affects, you know, everyone. And, uh, and I, I think that as I look in the audience, that there are Jews and non-Jews here, but people are sensitive to these lessons of history and wishing to do their part. So I think that it calls for us all as a society to, uh, to step up and, uh, and, and be responsible. Uh, 
to uh, ensure that that uh, that the, the tragedies will do, do not happen again. Um, how did you phrase so, it? Yeah, how did you best phrase the role of physicians? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 so don't, don't be on the spot. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I, so, so one one of the things that um, so why I first became aware of this legacy. Um, really when the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. put together a special exhibition called Deadly Medicine, Creating the Master Race. Um, and this was maybe 12, 15 years ago. Um, and I was invited to see this. And I knew you know, what a high school graduate would know about the Holocaust, but I had never taken a course in this. Um, and I was invited there because I happened to be working at the American Medical Association at the time. And I saw they, they wanted so basically someone from the AMA to come and look at the exhibition before it was put on public display to give them feedback about how doctors might respond to this special exhibition, which was entirely about um, really the years leading up to the Holocaust. So it was not about the medical aspects that most of us hear about, right? Mengele doesn't really show up in this exhibit. Maybe he does, but tiny player. It's a, it's a, it's the story of the public health impetus that led to um, the child euthanasia program, the T4 program, these programs which uh, you know, we could spend a lot of time on, but uh, these are the sort of precursor programs which medicalized and legitimized and, and in fact created the technology that allowed the mass murder of European Jewry to then take place. So, um, so I was not really very aware of that until I came to, these, uh, to this exhibition and we brought the whole Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs of the AMA to see the exhibition on storyboards and we put together this program which we took around the country and the more I worked with people who were really deeply engaged with uh, this history, the more I realized that um, it was in a, in a very um, fundamental sense wrong to leave commemoration of these events to the Jewish community, um, that this was not Jewish history, that I, what I was talking about was, was medical history. It was the history of non-Jewish doctors. And the idea that that whole history should be left in its commemoration to the Jewish community just, it felt increasingly wrong to me. Um, so, that, so that's how I sort of come to it, is the, the I, obviously this is Jewish history, I don't want to diminish that. Um, but for me, this is medical history, it's the history of my profession. Um, and it's equally the history of non-Jewish doctors doing these horrible things. And how did that happen, right? How did the most advanced industrialized nation on earth, with the most advanced medical community in the world, in the 10 years leading up to the Holocaust, there were 10 Nobel Prizes awarded in science, physiology, and medicine. Six of them went to Germany. 60% of the Nobel Prizes in medicine went to Germany in the 10 years before the war. So this was far and away. Our, our entire healthcare um, education enterprise is, was based in this time frame on the Flexner Report Flexner took his model as the German model. So our medical education system is built on the German medical education system. Um, the Germans were widely recognized as being the most advanced um, medical community in the world. This is where Michael DeBakey, the right. famous heart surgeon, had to go to Germany to get training because there was no one in the US who could do that kind of advanced cardiac surgical training. And leading the way with public health as well. Leading the way in public way. health, leading the way. So there are just many, many ways in which this was not about Jewish doctors. This was about the broad German medical community and incidentally or not incidentally, the rest of the international medical community who by and large went along with this until it went off the rails. And so, so, that, so that's the sort of, um, point of view that I bring to this. I think, Ira, the question you're raising, um, I, I wish I had a satisfying answer to it. Um, I am reminded of the fact 
uh, and I know this is going to be politically polarizing, I suppose, but uh, I just want to I just want to remind you all that in the first summer of the George W. Bush presidency, um, I vividly recall how poorly he was doing in the polls in August. Uh, the first summer of his presidency, his first ever um, major national address was about stem cell research. Anyone else remember this? Probably not. It probably didn't even make your radar screen, but this was the big deal of his presidency up until this point, was that he had to decide how we were gonna deal with stem cell research. And his um, approval rating was in the 40 something percent range nationally. It had been going down, 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 down. And then 9-11 happened. And I'll bet you all remember what his approval rating was in the weeks after 9-11, 90% and better. So the fact that a crisis will cause us to rally around a leader is indisputable. So that's fact number one. Fact number two is um, if you look at the Stanford prison experiments, if you look at the experiments with, you know, giving people shocks in the other room, there, it's just no doubt that about half or more of us <laughs> will do horrible things given the right circumstances, even when we know those things are wrong. So, uh, so those are just two realities of the human condition. So we have to figure out how to address those, those two um, really scary realities of the human condition, that we will rally to a cause when we, are a, when we perceive ourselves to be at great risk, and that we will all do terrible things. Most of us will do terrible things given the right circumstances. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to pitch this too much, but we're having this program over the next three days called the Aspen Ethical Leadership Conference, and we take this uh, exactly as this sort of um, predicate that um, it is not enough to make people aware that they are in a situation of ethical challenge, and it is not enough to help people analyze their ethical challenge to know what the right thing to do is. You also have to give them tools, scripts. You have to give them an opportunity to practice speaking up so that they have an, a chance to do, so when the, when the real situation arises, you will have a script in mind you will have a, a set of tools and skills in your toolbox for addressing this and being one of, it may be the minority, but, but you will be the one who is able to stand up and speak your mind. Um, there's a terrific book called Giving Voice to Values that uh, Mary Gentile has written about business ethics that is uh, super helpful in this regard. Um, she really teases apart uh, the fact that most of us know the right thing to do most of the time. What we don't always know is how to do it. How to do it. So we know what the right thing to do is. We don't always have a strategy for how to actually do it in real life. How to, what words to use, whom to call, how to bring your team together, right? These are practical, skills and, and things you can practice doing. So that's, that's my pitch no, no, for right. our program over the so next three a, a days. A few things. One, uh, Matt, I, I want to thank you for pitching the Aspen Ethical Leadership Program. That, that's great, and I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> the the yeah. second is, <laughs> uh, if you're already apologizing for your answers on question number two, we have a lot of work to be done in the remaining questions that we have. Uh, I do appreciate that um, the manner in, or, or the, there's not a view from nowhere. And the way you see uh, a circumstance and the way you describe a circumstance is gonna come from the position that you are, that you're, that you're coming from. You're gonna see the Holocaust as a, as, as a, through the eyes and the language of a medical professional. Someone else may see the Holocaust through the eyes and lens of uh, a, 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 either a, a family or, or a survivor or a child as a survivor. Um, I, wanna, I wanna push back a little bit when we talked about language and scripts um, especially because we all mentioned the dehumanizing language, the explicit language, the easy language to recognize as being wrong or as being influential in a deleterious way. 
Uh, but language, especially uh, language that we use every day for arguments or for persuasion, has a lot more power in shaping policy or, being, or having a policy use that language to shape people's perceptions uh, when it's not overt. And I'll give, I'll give a few examples. Uh, you know, when we talk about regulations, we paint a picture that laws and administrative codes hinder progress or individual choice. When we talk about consumer or patient protections, we talk about something that paints a very different picture. Right? In medicine, when doctors say, you know, cardiac surgical training or myocardial infarction, uh, they're giving a sense of authority from their profession or from their experience when they could say heart attack, which is something that a patient would understand. Uh, language in this, these cases are being used purposefully. Uh, and they're being used not only to explain, but to explain with certain connotations of authority, of influence, of vulnerability, and of motivating change in a certain direction. In Germany, like we said, they didn't use the term genocide. They used the term medicalized killing, because mass murder was now preventative medicine. Right? So yes, it's easy to understand the dehumanizing terms. But how do we make people aware, or if they're not going to the Aspen Ethical Leadership Program, thank you, Matt. How do we make people aware uh, that, uh, of the language that, that policy experts use uh, or that people in positions of authority use that might be used for the sake of pushing an agenda as much as it is painting a picture or describing things more generally. Sure. Okay, I want to first start off by words are extremely important. Okay, and so just how many of you ever see the news on TV? This is breaking news. Okay. Okay. So doesn't that create a sense of emergency or urgency yeah. or maybe something to be afraid of? Okay. So if we know that that's partly how things are done, fear is a way that we can control behaviors of population. Knowing that Ira is going to ask these questions, I found some quotes. I'm going to tell you. I cheated, by the way. I gave no, 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 no. He, because we got to think about it to have it's a way to contemplate. The Institute is so well prepared. Okay, yes. This is, <laughs> but these are quotes that doctors got to learn from. Okay, and so, for example, one quote was that medicine has to defend whatever individuals with a healthy genetic inheritance. So it's the role of doctors to defend those people that are genetically healthy. I mean, that sounds pretty reasonable, you know, but what's the other side of that? They called Hitler the doctor of the people. Hitler was the doctor of the people. Nazis had a moral duty to exterminate the Jews. Okay. The doctor must try to take care of healthy people. I mean, our role is that we take care of anyone who's coming in front of us, but that society was emphasizing a very subtle difference. We're going to take care of the healthy people because that was forsaking the vulnerable people. They would say things that not everyone has the same value, you know, so that allowed the permission to let go, kill the people. Not to have the same value or the, where they would define, this time we must recognize there's a plague, a plague that threatens the health of our society. Another one, the extermination process is part of the treatment. I mean, look how they're usurping the language to control the behaviors. Um, and so when we see this, I'm like, when I'm watching the news, okay, I have to, uh, this is from my work in Russia, is that you have to see what's being said and not said. So you have to watch and say what's really being said. What are the code words that are being used that we are controlling people's behavior? So when we use words like quotas instead of social justice, when we talk about states' rights as a way of determining how healthcare is done, those are coded words. When they talk about death panels, okay, I mean, so it, it's like they're saying, oh, we're, we're for life, but really, when you're not allowing people to have access to care, you're not paying for health care for people that are near death, but you're saying, but no, we're not having death panels. So it's a way of co-opting the process. And so we have to pay attention to what our mass media is saying, not only to us as adults, we have to be extremely vigilant as to what our children are seeing as part of mass media 
through their own access to the internet, through their own access to TV and whatever their social media are. Because children do not have the cognitive ability to discern. They're just absorbing it. They're taking it in. So it's a, a generational process. And what I wanted to say about your comments is what happened during the 9-11 is that I think people have a tendency or maybe a society has a tendency to have pacifism. I mean, we're not all trying to wake up every day to figure out who we're gonna kill, but patriotism is a way that you trump, excuse me, the pacifism <laughs> that people may inherently have because we all wanna take care of our society. We think that patriotism if how it's being sent to us can be a higher good. And I'm not talking about anarchy. I'm, not, I'm just saying that if we recognize, oh, that's what's motivating me to behave in a certain way, I think that's essential. Um, just to piggyback off of what Susan was saying, uh, particularly regarding children, I think that two of the key concepts to understand uh, here are the concepts of dehumanization, which we've talked about a little bit, and the concepts of medicalization. During the Third Reich, one of the things we, 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 one of the things that we were able, thanks Bill, uh, one of the things that we were able to do was create this concept of Jews as a cancer to society. Um, what would you do with a cancer? If someone had cancer, you cut it out. So what were we doing? We were cutting out um, the cancerous aspects of society as opposed to cutting out the cancerous aspects, you know, of, of the human body. So. Um, Doctors have a lot of power, uh, a lot of power. When, when, when doctors speak, people listen. Uh, and, and I've done some work in this as it pertains to psychiatry. When a psychiatrist gives a label, uh, that label has a lot of social value. Uh, so to go back to what Susan was saying about children, over the past 10 to 15, maybe even 20 years, there's been an, a, a very large rise in the diagnosis of ADHD among uh, young boys. Okay, so um, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old um, who, to the best of my knowledge, do not have a diagnosis, but uh, never stop moving. Ever, ever, ever. Okay, um, and so my five-year-old just started kindergarten last week, and now he's being asked to sit at a desk for six hours a day. Uh, that's hard. That's hard. Uh, just Developmentally speaking, I have a background in developmental counseling. That's hard. Um, we took it from something that, you know, is, a, is normal, takes a little bit of adjustment developmentally to uh, medicalizing it. So now we, we give a lot of diagnoses of ADHD. Uh, sometimes those diagnoses result in, in medication, and obviously that has its own issues. But other times it just results in a label. So now, instead of this child just feeling like, He's a normal kid who's going through kind of growing pains, for lack of a better term. Uh, now he's been labeled as having something wrong with him. He's been medicalized, right? And, and because doctors say it, it's got to be true. Because that's the society that kind of the way that we view the medical community. Um, and I do think actually, I mean, right now, I think more than, more than ever before, we do have a pushback on that. We do have... Um, you know, informed patients. We do have people that are advocating. But obviously during, during Nazi Germany, you know, what doctors said, that was it. So if the doctors are telling you this is the cause of, you know, our public health issues, these are the cause of our societal problems, and this is what we need to do to fix it, you're going to listen, right? So it's, it's the idea of kind of, I think, bringing these things to the surface um, and understanding also that you do have power to question things. We live in a democracy and you can question things. Not only can you question things, but you should question things. Uh, I think that's very, very important. Um, and I think that's important to understand um, for, for healthcare professionals, but arguably more importantly for those of us who aren't healthcare professionals, um, but sit on the other side of the desk. Um, I actually don't have a whole lot to add to what's been said, except that I, I don't think it's possible to avoid um, political language. Um, uh, you know, I, I, no matter if you're pro-choice or pro-life, those terms were created for a reason, mm -hmm. right? They both carry emotional valence, and people use them because of that. And they don't use other ways of describing it because they don't want those other connotations. 
Um, so, you know, sometimes it's really blatant. Um, I remember the Healthy Forests Initiative and the Clear Skies Initiative and Sunshine Rays. I don't know, these don't seem to be ringing any bells to you guys, but <laughs> these, are like all, these are all terms that have been used over the last 30 years. It was Ronald Reagan who uh, called uh, nuclear radiation sunshine rays. Because after all, nuclear radiation comes from the sun too, right? So why are we, what are we so afraid of? So, you know, sometimes it's really blatant and sometimes it's less blatant and sometimes it's probably not even recognized within us that we are using language that carries um, sort of emotional content um, and that conveys values, uh, whether we want it to, intend it to, or not. Um, so I, I think you're right. We have to pay attention to these things, um, be aware of them. I don't think it's possible to avoid them. Yeah, so I, I would just add, even though I usually ask the questions, that because it's impossible to avoid them, uh, one of the best ways to, to um, not get caught up or swept into to politicalized metaphors is to do two things. One, learn both sides of a debate as a second first language. So you may have the way you describe something, but if you don't understand how the other side is describing it, the conceptual metaphors that they're using, the premises that they're using, the, the coherent argument that they may be making or not, uh, you're never going to be able to understand how to, uh, how it talks past what you're saying without even knowing what they're saying at all. The second is because language today has such authority uh, and we have such a, a character of individualization, you should be empowered to ask questions. You know, there's been plenty of studies that, that have been showing that a lot of times patients, although it's, it's starting to change, when, uh, when, when, when uh, it doesn't even have to be a doctor, it could be a, a lawyer, any profession, when a professional says something in a certain language, uh, uh, a patient or a client will oftentimes go with it. And they'll go with it for two reasons. One, they, they trust that their fiduciary responsibility has that person, that profession's person, uh, that professional has their person best interest in mind. And the second is, they don't want to look stupid, right? But in the long term, you're looking stupid might, might be a, ben a benefit to you. Ask. If someone says, well, you have uh, you know, a myocardial infarction, say, what does that mean? I mean, you may be having a heart attack at the time, so it may be hard to speak. But you get my point. If someone is going to be speaking technical jargon, if you can't do it, have someone who can around you. Um, recognizing that you don't know something shouldn't be seen as a weakness or a vulnerability. It should be seen as humility and empowerment because now you know at least what to ask. So, but as I continue to ask questions, unless, okay, I'm gonna ask questions. Uh, I wanna go back to this uh, medicalization uh, and social values and how that relates to each other. Because I don't think it's only about medicalization. Uh, I think it's about um, science in general. And this, is, is, this may get a little controversial and I, I, I wanna put this in the, in the right light because um, a lot of times we, we look at, and, and we, we've discussed this already, how Germany had the most scientifically advanced medicine in the country, or in our country in the world. Uh, and its scientific advancements, uh, while at some point were pushing medicine forward, at another point they were doing the opposite of what we would call medicine. Right? Uh, in promoting Nazi, the Nazi agenda, they used national racial hygiene. Uh, they saw um, uh, social policies in scientific, not only medical, scientific terms. Like for example, uh, eugenics was now justified by a scientific theory of, of evolution. Social, uh, uh, um, social Darwinism is not Darwinism. Uh, it, it's, it, it uses the language and the understanding of what maybe, uh, uh, what is termed um, survival of the fittest. But what is deemed fittest has a very strong social presumption to it. How do we today, when we, when we, we look at these debates over uh, where science could go and how science could better or influence or affect our society, how do we, well, I'll give you an example. Even in the aspects of genetic engineering, uh, CRISPR debates that, that, that seem to be everywhere in the news, how do we recognize that these are not scientific debates alone, 
But these are scientific debates that are laden with social values. But these social values may not be made explicit. How do we bring that recognition of the social aspect of medicine and the social aspect of even the scientific pro uh, process, not in terms of the method of scientific discovery, but in interpreting that discovery for social policy, recognizing that that's as much a social plan as it is a scientific plan. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me just say a couple things about that. One <laughs> is that how appreciative I am for Ira to have put this program together. And you can see the sophistication with which uh, he has approached this. Number two, with, you know, um, uh, how appreciative that I am uh, that we have such experts, uh, sensitive, conscious, uh, knowledgeable people here to speak on this, that we, we're very fortunate to have Matt Winnie. You can see why he's now the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado, having been, I'm sure, actively sought by other institutions and uh, from his role at the AMA and then deciding to come to Colorado which gives him a great venue to come to Aspen, obviously. Mm -hmm. But you can see why uh, um, we, uh, he is where he is, number one. Number two, how Susan Miller um, is one of the leaders in the Houston medical community at Methodist Hospital and uh, her sophistication with it and, and the passion with which Stacy and the talent with which Stacy's approaching this via the Maimonides Institute of uh, Medicine and, uh, uh, and, and Ethics in the Holocaust. Let me just say, regarding your question of social uh, values and, uh, uh, and, and, and the language, that you know, while words matter, uh, there's, some, there's some issues that we all have been confronted with. For example, recently in the last election, with the medical aid in dying, physician-assisted death, physician-assisted suicide, uh, physician-assisted euthanasia. Matt just gave grand rounds, medicine grand rounds, at the university last uh, last week regarding the di the different uh, descriptions, definitions that one can that that one can use, and how that can be pejorative or that can be leading. The difference between physician-assisted suicide or medical uh, aid and dying. You know the subtlety thereof, which is a addressing the language and social values. But let me just, you know, throw out one that, that we're going to be confronting uh, more so, and that's in terms of, as Matt brought up, stem cells that George W. Bush addressed, and now we're dealing with genetic re-engineering designer babies. And what's spoken about here with the vitriolic conversation we can have in America versus what's, what China is doing in terms of just going ahead and doing it, perhaps. Uh, as a fait accompli and how potentially dangerous that can be to our, our civilization. I don't know, but that's, I think, a, that's part of the, of the appreciation that I have for the role that bioethics really should play. Wow, okay, so first of all, how many of you know what 23andMe is? How you can just do a swab and send it? I mean, gosh, that technology did not even exist. I mean, but why was that important? And so I, I, I want to take a step back and first of all say that medical ethics was actually part of the curriculum of physicians under National Socialist Medicine. Okay, so they, it was a utilitarian ethics and they tried to teach it and they were trying to think of eugenics as the most modern form of science even though they didn't have 23andMe. But their biology textbooks, I, I, I think we need to t take a step and look at that. They used eugenics to teach God-based, God-given natural laws, okay? Because what they were concerned about is that you had factors in the blood that would transmit race. That there was somehow, there was something about your genetics that would transfer something that would weaken and contaminate other people. That that's what they were concerned about. Okay, so they wanted to know which percentage of blood that you had, blood, you know, this sort of issue. And they were trying to use the eugenics as a scientific justification for racism. 
Okay, that's what they were trying to do and as an argument for how they could implement their social policies, okay? And they, what they thought was that through this genetic transmission of subhumans that they thought it was gonna weaken um, humanity. And then, so that's why they were really concerned about a biological diagnosis of race. Okay, and so, but let's take that now back to the present and as, um, Bill is talking about just just really pay attention to what's happening with CRISPR and all this sort of thing and how they're doing mitochondrial research and that you can have more than one genetic parent in the cell, maybe three, you know, have the mitochondria from one and the XY from two, so you have three people contributing to the genetic information for that. And, and, and so that the rationale for that is that they're saying we're going to get rid of diseases with it. But I think actually what's a far more fascinating question is how we're going to use this genetic information for enhancement. So are we going to use this to say, I want all of my children to be six feet, okay, because five foot four, okay, I, I don't consider that a medical um, illness, but there may be that they want to have blonde hair, blue eyes, and certain heights, okay, so it's not just how we're using this information for health, but how we're trying to use it for enhancement. But I want to know is that when the physicians and the social scientists that are doing this research, what is their social responsibility? So I'm taking it, flipping your question to say, it's not just how we're using it for science, but how are we using, what is our social responsibility in doing this research? So am I working for the military as part of this? Am I trying to do research looking at microbial um, illnesses that can have an effect on, on society? And, 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 and I'm also thinking social responsibility is who does this help? Does it help a minority subset of people that have resources in the society? Or is it a way that we're defining who gets to survive and live longer within a, a culture? And so I think what 23andMe is teaching us is that there's no genetic basis of race, okay? I mean, because we could define ourselves as a race is based on blonde hair races, brunette races, green eye races, you know, versus skin color, red, yellow, green, whatever. But as a culture, as a society, we want to know who's supervising this. So when you talk about a fait accompli that is happening in China, we can look at the stem cell research that occurred in, in, in South Korea. Okay, and so the, the work could not occur in the U.S., but it could occur in South Korea because they didn't have the religious sanctions against that sort of work. It's more of a Buddhist society, so they didn't have laws preventing that from happening. But who was overseeing it and who was seeing whether it was scientifically valid? We found out that it was corrupted. And, and I think that the mist what we did have to relearn, okay, we can't forget for how we define what is the betterment of society, because that's what Germany was trying to do. I mean, if you step back and say, really, why did they behave that way? It's because they were trying to better the society, and we're still doing the same thing. And if we don't look at these lessons from the past, um, I think that we're at risk of, again, creating a new moral harm. Okay, um, sorry. That's okay. There's a great quote um, in the book, When Medicine Went Mad. Um, edited by Art Kaplan, and the quote says, um, science can invent the atomic bomb, but it can't tell you whether or not to use it. Right, so science doesn't exist in a vacuum. Science exists in the context of society. Uh, when Darwin, you know, came up with his ideas, his motive was not what his ideas wound up being used for. Um, just ironic fun fact, if you're at a party and you think people might enjoy this. Uh, the, the founder of the eugenic movement was actually Francis Galton, who is Charles Darwin's cousin. So uh, he took that idea, this idea, which, which um, uh, to the extent that anything can be objective, was more objective. And he took it and said, well, you know, if we can figure out what the traits are that kind of um, make for a stronger human being, then let's take it to the next level. Um, so he, he built off of his cousin's idea, but not necessarily in the way that his cousin anticipated. So I think one of the things that's very, very important to understand is what is the motive behind science? And that's something that we can all do. That's something we can all question, right? When we're hearing these things, what is the motive behind it? As you were saying, um, you know, you, you hear, um, I believe we, we were talking about this earlier, 
uh, Diet Coke, right? We're a, a bunch of Diet Coke fans up here. Um, and the joke, you know, had to do with, well, Diet Coke, except for Matt. Uh, <laughs> Diet Coke is, you know, it's good for you. It's good for you. you know. um, who sponsored it? I'm pretty sure it was Coca-Cola. You know, where are these studies coming from? We need, we need to ask ourselves that. We need to say, you know, who is behind this? What is the motive? Um, where are they going with that? Um, we need to constantly be asking these questions in order to maintain that system of checks and balances that is so essential. Um, so uh, I'm reminded of um, when you mentioned uh, we just invented it. We can't tell you whether to use it. The um, defense that the Bayer Corporation put on after the war about their having invented Zyklon B, but they didn't tell the German army how to use it. It wasn't them, right? They were not responsible for the use to which this product was put, even though it was invented specifically for this purpose. Um, that defense was raised again just a few weeks ago. Uh, I don't know how many of you are, might be psychologists. Do we have any psychologists in the room? No? Um, so the two psychologists, uh, Mitchell and Jessen, who were involved in developing the coercive interrogations program, made the argument under, uh, when they were brought uh, to court a few weeks ago, that they just invented these coercive interrogation techniques. They didn't say when to use them or whom to use them on or whether it was ethical to ever use them or legal to ever use them. They could not be held responsible for the use to which their inventions had been put. Um, they settled, so that case is over and uh, the settlement is under seal, so we will never know exactly uh, how that played out. Um, what I want to mention uh, in that regard is that um, the American Psychological Association was torn apart by this episode. Um, they spent the last decade um, and are still trying to atone for the fact that their association failed to catch this and prevent it. And um, we just finished, I was on a special panel for the American Psychological Association looking at their ethics processes and how to change their ethics processes to try and avoid such a thing ever happening again. Um, so I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you, uh, I think unequivocally, that um, that profession uh, is aware and um, responsive to these issues in a way that they were not before. And I suspect that we can rely on professional associations to a certain extent to track and monitor these kind of things, right? So CRISPR is not being developed without a lot of people thinking about the ethics of CRISPR, including the people most famously who invented CRISPR and have been very involved in subsequent discussions about what should be the social limits we place on this at this stage, at future stages, what do we need to know? How can we learn that before we you know, move forward on certain things that you're right, they may move forward on um, in other countries. Uh, and by the way, someone may be moving forward with these things in a garage somewhere in the US. These are not particularly difficult um, you know, techniques. Uh, but the profession is responsible for making sure that we don't create tools that are very easy to misuse, and we should be doing that, right? I think we will, we will be, uh, we have responsibility here as scientists, as medical professionals, to, to be having these conversations, um, and we are. I'm not going to say you know everything is settled because it's not. This is very much an open. There's an open set of questions around the use of these uh, genetic engineering technologies. Um, but the fact that we're having the conversations is is at least heartening to me. Um, and the fact that it's not the case that these things are just sort of moving forward willy nilly, at least not in our country and in and in Europe, 
um, there are a, a, a bunch of people who are very aware of the ethical risks um, and the practical risks, um, incidentally. Given the, uh, given the time that we have, I have one last, uh, hopefully easiest question uh, for everyone. And then I want to invite uh, then I want to invite everyone for a light reception afterwards where we'll all be around to continue the conversation and answer questions if you have any and just talk more about the, about the topic. Uh, the easy question I have for you is where, where is Holocaust bioethics being taught today in, in medical schools and in, in healthcare professional schools? And where, where, so I guess it's a hard question, and where could it be taught? Uh, you know, answer as, as, I want to say as briefly as you can. You could say nowhere, but that wouldn't be true. So no, it's not true nowhere. Um, but in fact, uh, Bill and I were involved in a national survey of every medical school uh, and Mark Levine, um, every medical school in the United States and Canada about what five years ago now, um, uh, 2014. 2013 was the survey. 13. 2014 the so, paper. So coming on for four years ago, um, and the answer was uh, there are 16 schools in, of. 16%, sorry, 20, 22 schools um, out of 140 odd schools uh, in the US and Canada where this is part of the required curriculum, where some aspect of the history of medical involvement in the Holocaust um, is being taught. So it's not ubiquitous. Um, there were not obvious uh, connections. The schools, uh, some of the schools that teach this uh, have a Jewish heritage. Some of them are physically situated near to a Holocaust museum. So that may be an influence. Um, but not, you know, there, there did not seem to be any easy predictors of which schools were going to have um, this in the curriculum and which were not going to have it in the curriculum. Um, and this is very much an active article of discussion for us is how to get more medical schools to teach um, history of medicine in general. Um, and this particular history, which is so powerful, so powerfully instructive, so, so very important to understand um, how to teach this history in particular, we could probably spend a whole other hour talking about the variety of reasons why it is so difficult both to teach and to learn from this history. It, it is very difficult to learn these lessons for a variety of reasons. Just pass it down. Um, so, a few years ago, we created the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. And the mission was to get this information out there uh, to as many people as possible. So uh, we have a website, and our website features webinars. Actually, uh, Matt, when he did a wonderful webinar for us on the Deadly Medicine exhibit that we were talking about earlier, where they do a guided tour. So you can see that before it comes to the University of Colorado in, in, uh, in April, correct? Yeah. In April. yeah. Yes. Um, so we do a lot of work, basically, and the idea is to try and get this information out there. So anyone can see these webinars. Anyone can view them. They're free. Um, to the general public, and we, we offer continuing medical education credits uh, for physicians, physician assistants, nurses, and pharmacists. And the reason for that is this is an issue that's important to everyone. The relevance of this topic is, is so broad, and we really have a responsibility, and all of us here feel this way, uh, we really have a responsibility to continue to reflect upon the past in order to protect the future. Um, we need to keep working, right? So whether that's throughout medical school curriculum, whether that's creating nonprofit organizations and um, getting that information out there. We recently started a Department of Bioethics in the Holocaust as part of the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics. So we can take this international, we can get it to as many people as possible. Um, and I think it's very important to get this information out there in whatever forms we can to healthcare professionals, to interested uh, parties, you know, and, and just kind of allow people to understand the history because without understanding the history, uh, we're doomed to repeat it. And, and I think, you know, that's a danger and, and, and we are facing a danger right now where, you know, we are not going to have people around to tell these stories firsthand for too much longer. So it's up to us. It's up to all of us sitting in this room to go out and tell the stories, um, to do what we can do. We all have a voice. We can all use it. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's very important um, that we emphasize that. Your turn. Uh, go right ahead. Okay, so I, I, I want to bring us back to what do we as physicians 
have a responsibility for, especially since we have such a historical um, component in this. Is that, so I think we look at doctors as having moral roles within society. I mean, religious people do, parents do, but I think physicians also have moral roles within a society. And part of this um, is related to how much impact we have in life and death situations. Okay, because that's where physicians have an intersection in um, this. But it's not just that we have life-death decisions, but we are also recipients of confidential information, human frailties, you know. Uh, we hear stories of where people make moral mistakes. We see examples of human nature as part of our day-by-day -day process. And because we have um, a role in life and death situations, we have a tendency to think we're omnipotent, okay, because we're making these sort of decisions. And part of our training is that we have to learn how to dissociate because we are, we see suffering, so we can't always just absorb that, and we may also cause suffering. So I think that that is an essential component of how we look at what roles we have in society. It's not just knowing the history, but looking at how we behave in moments, okay? Because our, our moral decisions happen in the moment. I mean, we can know about things in the past and we can anticipate in the f future, but most of our decisions occur in a moment. It doesn't come labeled as such, and all of a sudden you've got the situation in front of you. So if we don't have our own internal awareness and to learn where we have our own tunnel vision and where we're at risk ourselves, I think until we unlearn some of the things that we just do kind of as a reflex, I think that we're again vulnerable to making moral errors. So that should be part of the training. So it's not just the webinars, it's not just bioethics, not just case studies, it's not just grand rounds, but having the medical humanities component of us and, and to look at our own humanity in our role as um, members of society. Well, listen, I wanna, I wanna thank our panelists for having such a deep and thoughtful conversation uh, with us. And I wanna thank the audience uh, who, was, uh, who came tonight, who was, who was able to uh, not only um, hear the words that the panelists had to say, but also just by virtue of being here and showing your support to show how important this, this issue is, uh, not only in terms of the history, uh, but in terms of the future of, of genocide and contemporary bioethics. So thank you so much. Uh, now I want to invite everyone to have uh, you know, a light reception where we're going to have uh, do we have Q and A? Or well, any we're going to do a little bit more of an inf informal Q and A. Ah, uh, so okay. that way, so everybody so has a chance to ask questions. So because uh, the thing is, right now you guys are all together. We want to break you guys up, break it up. and okay. have everyone ask questions, people individually, in just a more informal setting. So please, I want to invite everyone. Um, you know, ha we have drinks and food and so forth. Feel free to. I want to say attack our panelists, but I'll say approach our panelists. Ask them as many questions as you as you want and as you can. And again, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming.